Good morning, everybody. I'm Charlie Fink with Ted Chilowitz. It's This Week in XR. Today is Friday, uh, February 4th. Uh, we've got a great guest coming. Uh, Derek Belch, co-founder and CEO of Striver, the VR training company, uh, made famous when NFL quarterbacks started using it. Uh, and also, I would like to thank our sponsor, Verbella. Good morning, Ted. Great to see you. Morning, Charlie. Always good to see you. It was a good week and uh, lots of volatility today that we should oh talk about. Oh my God, did Facebook get hammered yesterday? Yeah, it's... Um... You know, I was uh, obviously these things as we're involved in these uh, things and these relationships make you think about, you know, what does that actually mean, right? And what do we learn from the past? Uh, because uh, for a little bit of time now, you, I, other people, you know, that track the industry, we're talking about the bubble of this, right? That suddenly everybody is in the metaverse, has a metaverse play. If we remember at CES, there were all these funny pictures of people like taking pictures of every little booth that was right. kind of metaverse. And angle. everything. <laughs> so, you know, suddenly that, that starts to define as a bubble. And then, um, you know, there's a moment, right? where um but I, but I, I think it probably has more to do with the evolution of uh, people's social media preferences and choices and the first time that revenue didn't sort of outpace well it should be no time. surprise to anybody that um facebook with 2.3 billion users is finding it hard to find more users right now their attrition uh with i think two and a half billion users uh, was less than 1%. So it's not like Facebook is crashing. They are struggling, particularly on Instagram, with Apple's changes in their privacy policies, yeah. uh, which benefit consumers. Yeah. So um, I, I don't have any problem with that. I thought the VR business was great. Yeah. They may, have made over a billion dollars from their app store. Right. They you know, had sales of almost a billion dollars of VR headsets. You know, they're, they're clearly in a great, and Apple is delaying any kind of entry uh, into the VR market until next year, at least. Right. So, uh, you know, they've got the market to themselves. Zuckerberg has been saying that they're going to invest $10 billion a year in this new division. And there's no reason uh, to think that's not a great strategy. If you're a VR skeptic, I guess that's a reason. But, you know, this is happening and it's accelerating. So. Yeah. At 25% discount, listen, you miss your numbers by 1% of the stock drops 25%. That's a buying opportunity, whether there's a tech bubble or not. Yeah, that, I think that's what, what a lot of us are, are discussing. I was also thinking about, um, you know, a few weeks ago, General Electric was getting beat up uh, as a company that's been around forever, making goods and services for the entire planet and had to sort of separate into, into multiple companies because of it, right? Um, and their business is old school into new school economy, but real goods and services, right? Companies like Facebook, Google, Snap, et cetera, you know, um, live in this virtual world and have built virtual economy around it and have grown gigantic because of it. Um, because of this massive ability for this thing called the internet to allow gigantic user bases to come and this perception of, you know, value that's all free. And, you know, then they tapped into an advertising model that was mighty. Um, but you can see that it's a little bit built on a house of cards, right? So when you start to learn that a moment like this can just have such massive impact on the stock, it's a it's a good learning thing for all, like a lot of us that are involved in this in this industry. Well, you know, everything that goes up uh, will come, come down. down. It just yeah. doesn't come down as far as it was a year ago. Right. Right. And this these is companies like basically up winding much the price. Too, right? This is basically winding the price back to where it was at the end of 2020. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So I, I'm not ready to, it's funny because my financial advisor this morning sent me an email saying tech winter is here. We must mm. reposition because his feeling is I'm overextended in tech. But my feeling is that, I mean, when you look at it, Google's about to go four for one. That is going to goose the stock considerably. Yeah. Uh, Facebook, uh, as I said, uh, was overly punished, although to your point, perhaps uh, it was timely and necessary. Um, 
you know, because Mark Zuckerberg is answered is accountable to nothing except the stock of the company. Right. Yeah. He's he's got all the voting shares. He controls the board of directors. And we've talked about this before, right? No one else would, no board of directors would let someone spend $10 billion a year with no obvious way to get it back, except the model is there for Xbox and Sony, both invested billions of dollars to get their game console business going. And I don't think that's any different than what's happening at Facebook. So yeah, so it so it becomes an interesting uh, piece of language. Is it foolish or is it foresight, right? And to your point about the success of them really turning a number of corners in the commercialization of virtual reality, bringing it into a viable cost, viable system, removing the friction points, creating a user economy and, an, and, a, and a creator economy that's now you know out of the millions and into the billions um, is you know, is, to me, is, is quite admirable and, and not easy to do. So I think you have to sort of take this uh, in and, and look at the big picture, right? And, and you and I, as people that really study the forward trajectory of things, um, I think it's, it's a, an interesting time to study what they're really trying to do to evolve themselves well, as a I company just, when they learn, right? I would say this to our listeners. I mean, for, first of all, I put my money where my mouth is. Second of all, um, you know, you get you got to take the long term with Meta, for example. Do you believe in VR? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Because if you believe VR is going to be huge, then they're going to get the largest dividends. I think the other thing that's becoming clear to me is as many of the smaller companies are attractive because they have so much more room for growth. Yeah, um, I, I think this is a big company world. I think, you know, as an investor, you just buy those giant stocks, no matter when, at no matter what price, because 10 years from now, those stocks are going to be many times larger than they are. By the way, for, for posterity, because this thing is going to live in the internet and the metaverse for a long time, we should probably both state very clearly we are not stock professionals not giving stock advice in any way shape or form we are just speculating no, for we're, we're purposes. talking about uh you know what we're doing and certainly listen neither of us has the ability to really time stocks that is the difference between being in a big mutual fund and trading on your own um, you give up some upside but they dampen the volatility because they follow earnings calls and, and things of that nature, economic announcements that affect the price of stock, and they can flatten out the volatility. Of course, mm. you give up a little bit of the upside. But but as I said, I don't think there's any risk in these giant tech companies. They, they will um, continue to grow uh, internally and externally, and they're very acquisition-minded. So... Uh, when value is created by these startups, they tend to harvest it. So I, I just we're in this middle of this giant trend where the big get bigger. Look at what's happening at Microsoft. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What? Eighty billion dollars for for Blizzard Activision? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So and you know the other thing about Meta is they are really knocking off all of the things on their product roadmap as they said they would. They're spending mm -hmm. the ten billion dollars on their system. Yeah. Uh, they're they've got a giant Super Bowl thing coming. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're pedal to the metal and I, I don't see them, they're not going to pull back on this. Uh, and I think that that slowdown in Facebook in a way validates uh, Zuckerberg's thesis that, you know, things are going to move to other platforms. Yeah, that it's time to turn a page, right? And he's yeah, trying and to turn so, that page. Yeah, Facebook is going to go down and this is probably not the end of it. Facebook could go down 10%. Facebook could go down 20%. I'm talking about the Facebook aspect of their business yeah the, the Facebook but you know product. instagram is doing great there is they have competition from tiktok but you know they have a large audience they've introduced reels uh you know clearly they're not sleeping there um, but you know social media is evolving and people are attracted to different platforms and and they'll get sick of them soon enough and then they'll be the next thing so right. Right. Um, Which is anyway, why they... the, the point was, uh, in the column I talked about their introduction this week of um, advanced avatars and moving those avatars across all of the platforms. And yes. as you know, I'm, I'm, I believe the avatar is probably one of the most valuable assets in the metaverse, uh, especially when it's attached to a wallet and all your digital assets. Um, you know, it's, it's the avatar and your spawn point that, that matter the most. Yeah. 
it starts to become your real identity or part of your real identity. And when you study- And as our social media profiles are today, it's just, you know, in a metaversal concept, you know, it becomes much more important than front and center. Yeah. Well, and when you, when you study, when you study gaming culture and you see how much time uh, people spend in building and customizing their avatars uh, to live in those game worlds that they play, this is absolutely, you know, an, an, an important part of the ecosystem. No question. So have you heard of this company named, called in Emerge? Emerge, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. They use the... ultrasonic <laughs> sound to provide haptic feedback in VR. So no data glove or anything mm -hmm. like that is required. It's kind of a, like a, I don't know, a pad. Yeah, it's like a pad like, with a bunch like a of um, inductors on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you hold your hand over it. It's really, really interesting tech. And they've got uh, some really interesting investors like Matthew Ball, who wrote the Metaverse Manifesto. Yeah, I've, I've tested the their their system out a number of times. I was sort of invited very early on to see it when it was quite crude, and now they're yeah, slyly you know, the co-founder invited me to see it also. And, and as you said, it's um, a light touch as opposed mm -hmm. to a, a glove, which gives you yeah more of an immersion, but of course provides a lot of friction. It's not as simple. It's just it's just a piece of that simulation puzzle, right? And and you know, for the idea that you're going to need this for certain things in the world of creating visual and tactile simulation, it's one approach that is, you know, simple and you don't have to sort of don and doff all this stuff and deal with all these sort of things. Um, you know, it's interesting. We'll see where it goes. So, so um, other news, Cisco is slowly rolling out a telepresence system, which is the promised HoloLens uh, holoportation. They're right. not calling it, they're calling it WebEx holograms, but it's what uh, Microsoft was demoing in um, 2016, uh, you know, and it was, it was really kind of a faked, if you will, just like the whale yeah. jumping through the floor. In fact, I think the whale kind of saved them from getting walloped for that. <laughs> Everybody was so- the Magic Leap whale, yeah. <laughs> busy getting on poor old beaten up Magic Leap. Uh, I see Derek is here. Let's let's have him join us. Oh, great. Okay. Sounds good. I'd like to introduce our guest, Derek Belch. He's the co-founder and CEO of Striver. Derek, great to see you. Hey, Charlie. Yeah, thanks for having me. Likewise. Um, last time I talked to you, you were rolling out uh, a massive uh, training platform for um, uh, Walmart. Yep. Can you, how is that going? Yeah, well, we're, we're in, uh, it's, this is crazy to say out loud, we're, we're in year five with Walmart. <laughs> wow. That first phone call, I, I, that, I think we, we talked about this, Charlie, a while back. I like to call it uh, a fortuitous inbound that, that came with, with Walmart, you know, and it was, that was back in the summer of 2016. Uh, and here we are, uh, you know, five, five plus years later, and uh, it, it's going well. You know, I think, I think, uh, Everyone in the world over the last two years, with the exception of Zoom and toilet paper companies, <laughs> has been has been feeling the pain a little bit with with COVID related stuff. And we've we've been working through our fair share of challenges with our customers too. But as a whole, uh, things are in a very very good place. Charlie, why don't we why don't we back up a step uh, because you guys dove right into it and <laughs> um, have Derek give us a little sense of what Striver is, what Striver does. Um, That's true. I'm assuming everybody kind of knows just sure. because you yeah. have been around so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give a little more than the elevator pitch, but it, it won't it won't be that long. Um, you know, so we're we are eight years old. Uh, we were founded in January of 2015. Uh, this is our eighth year, I should say. And uh, the genesis of Striver is uh, I played football at, at Stanford University's undergrad. Uh, ended up working in consulting, going to business school, and then I had this crazy thought: if I don't see coaching before I turn 30, I'm going to regret it forever. So I actually went back up to Stanford and coached for the football team in 2013 and 14. And you guys can appreciate this as, uh, as academics. You know, at this point, I'm kind of overeducated. I don't need another master's. But the only way to get the job was to be a coach, um, or excuse me, was to be in a grad program while I was coaching. I was a graduate. I was a graduate assistant. So they pay for your school and they give you a stipend of like a thousand bucks a month in exchange for, you know, 200 hours a week of, of work. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, long story short, my, my master's thesis with, with Jeremy Balenson, who you alluded to earlier, uh, was to come up the way to train football players using virtual reality. And it was such a successful academic project 
that Stanford's head coach, David Shaw, like literally sat me down in December of 2014 at the end of the season and was like, Hey dude, you got to get out of here and go start it. <laughs> go start it. Yeah. Go yeah. get it going. Nice. And so, so that's how it started. I mean, he, David actually offered. To give I think the first, the first I heard about it was because Carlson Palmer, Carson Palmer, yeah. who at the time I think was the Arizona, yep. uh, the Arizona Cardinals uh, yep. quarterback. Uh, was yep. using it for training and was very enthusiastic about it. So you guys were able to leverage that uh, yep. in uh, getting some uh, extra attention, which you get from the press, which, you know, includes me. Uh, and yep. that was the first time I said, what? Yeah. <laughs> yep. You can do that? And I sat there for hours trying to figure out how do they do that? How do you capture the defensive look the week before the game? How do you simulate that? Uh, so I thought it was a really interesting problem. And I'd be interested in, in I think our interest, our listeners would be interested because all of these training experiences are bespoke. They are yeah. made by and for the companies that are your clients. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, so uh, we'll go back briefly, then we'll talk about where we are today. Right. So five, six, seven years ago when this started in sports and, and even today, because um, we still have a handful of sports customers, even though we're predominantly an enterprise um, enterprise business. Um, we were actually filming practice on the field with 360 degree cameras. Uh, and, and at the time it was like one guy in a building per team and we were doing all this manual work and it took hours you know, after practice. And then we got it faster and faster and faster to where starting a few years ago, it was like film the play, take it off the field, put the memory card in and boom, you're, you're good to go within you know, five minutes. And so the teams are very self-sufficient today. Well, today in the enterprise, the enterprises aren't yet self-sufficient. They're not that self-sufficient in many things when it comes to enterprise software, right? When we think about the world of systems integrators and all that. But yeah, Charlie, to your point, you know, as of today, it's going to change. You're going to start to see more off-the-shelf content. You're going to start to see more DIY in the future. But as of today, where the industry is and kind of our, our thesis here for really making a learning, uh, an impact on learning and development, yeah, it, it, it's a bespoke custom content engagement with each customer. And, you know, to be honest, that's, that kind of is, is at our, <laughs> that's not to the benefit of Striver. That's to the, because these are different margins than right. software. Yeah. That's to the benefit of, of the customer. Um, but the end result is really, really high impact learning scenario, scenarios and simulations to where we've got some incredible data about impact on real world performance that you just wouldn't get with an off the shelf module. So, so Derek, you kind of walked quickly through your sports evolution to where the bulk of your business is now. Why don't you call out some of the key clients and what kind of actual uh, training and simulation sure. and benefits um, you're, you know, who, yep. who's doing it and what are they doing? Yeah, yeah, certainly. I'll, I'll, I mean, I can talk about most of them. Uh, there's a couple that I can't, but I'll, I'll talk about sure. most of them. Well, we understand um, that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Walmart was the first, you know, lucky us, uh, a blessing and a curse. Fortune one is your first enterprise customer. <laughs> um, and they, and we, we really kind of hunkered down with Walmart for a good, you know, 12 to 18 months to really, you know, figure this thing out and make sure we didn't screw it up uh, with them. And we, we, did, we didn't screw it up. Um, we kind of went through that product market fit evolution, kind of doing some testing and some pilots here, or there as the dust has settled and, and where we are today. Um, you know, we're very fortunate to be working with Walmart, Bank of America, FedEx, Verizon, Sprouts, uh, Farmers Market, MGM, and, and the list goes on, right? So these are, these are big, these are big companies. I mean, <laughs> these are, you know, we, we, we got the Fortune 50 taken care of with some of these, right? Um, and, and, and as a whole, I think the best way to think about what they're doing, as you asked, Ted, right, is, uh, and I'll, I'll make this, you know, as quick and simple as I can. There's four buckets, that every like use case falls into with training and development. Operations, process, procedures, that's bucket one. Um, safety and hazards from the most basic thing like a spill on aisle five to like an active shooter training and everything in between, right? Customer, customer service, interacting with customers, you know, uh, logistics and throughput and what would we do to improve the customer experience here if you're a manager or something. And then uh, all things soft skills, manager training, et cetera. So, those are the four buckets. And at this point, all of our customers have done one or all of those things, and they choose how deep they want to go in, in each of those different areas based on their business needs. And you distribute Oculus Quest now or Oculus Go to the clients? What are they? Uh... Yeah, so we're, 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 I mean, listen, you guys know this space better than most people. Up until 
18 months ago, Oculus was the only game in town. So we were using Oculus hardware uh, exclusively, but not, not necessarily by design. Um, but Oculus has been a very good partner for us over the years. Um, now we're starting to see more folks pop up, right? HTC continues to improve. Pico is, is a very legitimate device. Hewlett Packard's come out with something, you know, probably in the next 12 months or so. Everyone's talking about Apple, right? Lenovo's starting to get in the game. So stuff is happening. We're, we're trying really hard to be agnostic. Um, and, and as of today, we've put more time and energy into the devices that exist, but over time, we're going to be agnostic. So before we wrap up here, let's, let's talk about um, the business today and, and you, the opportunity in, in yep. v, using VR for corporate training. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So as of today, um, you know, objectively, not arrogantly, I like to say, you know, we're you, bringing the sports metaphor back. Uh, we're the biggest, fastest, strongest, you know, company and startup in, in this space, right? Uh, using virtual reality for learning and development. And, and more specifically, I'll, I'll hold my prop here, using in headset virtual reality. That, that's a key distinction because VR is, is, you know, it's not yet ubiquitous. There's a lot of challenges with scale. And so a lot of companies are just saying, yeah, I'll, I'll just throw that on a computer screen. How's that any different than what they're doing, you know, with e-learning, right? And so we are laser focused, Charlie, on in-headset VR. Like that is the disruption, right? That is the benefit. And, and, and doing it at scale is our competitive edge, right? And so I, I mentioned those customers you know, we've got a lot of employees. We, we just did another fundraise round that we'll announce at some point in the next couple of months. Um, we're, we're, we're doing it. And now we got to do it even more. <laughs> how know? big, how big is the company? How many people, how, how big do you go with this stuff? What, what's yeah, it, what's required? 130 employees. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, I won't say specifics, but you know, we'll be over 20 million in revenue th this year, which is, which is really, yeah, terrific. Yep. And, and, and I, I think the key metric here guys is we have by the end of, Q2 of this year, we will have over 25,000 devices out in the field across our customer base. Wow. And we, yeah. And, and we've had a almost number. a million unique trainees over the last few years. I mean, those are just like, mm -hmm. by the way, th there's a pro and a con to all this. So again, it's not arrogant, it's subjective because <laughs> there, I'll, I'll talk all day about the challenges in addition to the benefits. But I mean, these are orders of magnitude higher than anyone else doing in headset VR. And so we're really trying to double down on that moving forward. Yeah, Charlie and I very often talk about the kind of hidden gem world of virtual reality being used for corporate training, simulation learning, building skills, you know, risk mitigation, risk management, and that, you know, people don't realize this is not a small business now. There are many companies that are actually, you know, deploying successfully and running companies with 50 yep. to 100 to 200 employees and, a, you know, and, a, and a, a massive payroll, a massive sort of business yep. dynamics. These are not tiny little, you know, one, two person operations. Um, yep. Accenture bought, what was it, 60,000 headsets? Yeah. Yeah. From, yep. from yep. Oculus. So, I mean, it's that's a big, big purchase. Right. Well, I, very I, large and influential company. Yeah, I think the most encouraging thing about this space, which you guys love, because that means you get to talk about it more in addition to all your, your other work. Um, I mean, this isn't like the, the little startups, you know, dabbling here, right? I mean, these are the big tech players. <laughs> you know, I just listed off about we've got Facebook slash Meta, Microsoft, SAP, Apple, Lenovo. I mean, everyone, Google, they're all doing something in this space. And it's still the Wild West a little bit. You know, some, some things still have to work themselves out. But very encouraging, very encouraging. And, and hopefully we can, uh, hopefully we can capitalize on it yeah yep. sounds like you are which is good we're excited yep. for it. more and more people get these in the in the home you know they're they're going to start to proliferate more quickly in, yep. in parts of the economy and you know, enter yep. entertainment yep. uh, derek thank you for joining us this morning it's been a great conversation and uh great to see you virtually hopefully we'll we'll all be together in the real soon yeah seriously, seriously. <laughs> have a great right. weekend everybody and thank you for Thanks, everyone. See you next week.